I would say good morning, but I don't know when you'll be listening to this, so I'll just say hello. I have to tell you, it's really odd sitting here alone in my office making this recording. Two weeks ago, I'm not sure any of us would have expected you'd be listening to this at your home versus all of us being together at church. But then again, we wouldn't have expected many things that have happened recently. We can only pray that this passes quickly and we're back together as soon as possible. Today, we start a new series on the Epistle to the Romans or Letter to the Romans. A note about Bible translations. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version or ESV, but if you'd like to use your own translation, just pause the video until you found the verse. We're going to divide this first lesson into two videos. The first is background information, and the second is the lesson itself. The Epistle to the Romans is the sixth book of the New Testament and it's almost universally accepted among biblical scholars that it was written by the Apostle Paul. It's also the longest of Paul's epistles. When I was researching this and I came upon the word epistle, my curiosity was aroused as I wasn't completely sure I knew the difference between an epistle and the Gospels. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are about the life of Jesus, his words, and his teachings. An epistle or other is a letter or other message to Christians at that time, usually written to a specific church. They're usually driving them to take some action or correct some issue. They also sometimes serve to clear up important questions of faith or doctrine. Let's answer some questions about Romans. Where was it written? When was it written? And why it was written? The letter was most probably written while Paul was in Corinth, probably while he was staying in the house of Gaius, and transcribed by Tertius, his amanuensis. There are a number of reasons why Corinth is considered most plausible. Acts chapter 20, verses 2 and 3 says, When he had gone through those regions, had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. The verse says that Paul spent three months in Greece during his trip from Macedonia to Jerusalem. Since Corinth was the location of Paul's greatest missionary success, it seems likely that Corinth was the location. Also, Phoebe is mentioned in Romans chapter 16 as a deacon of the church at Centuria. She would have easily been able to convey the letter to Rome after taking a ship from Corinth's west port. Erasmus, who's mentioned in Romans 16, verse 23, also lived in Corinth, being the city's commissioner for public works and city treasurer. More evidence comes from Acts. Acts chapter 18, verse 12 says, but when Gallio was pro council of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. This was while Paul was in Corinth during his second missionary journey. Next, let's talk about when Romans was written. We don't know precisely when it was written as it's not mentioned in the epistle, but from clues in the books of Romans and Acts, we're fairly confident it was written somewhere between 52 and 58 AD. The most significant fact supporting the earlier date is Paul's appearance before Gallio that we just talked about. Ancient inscriptions indicate that Gallio was pro of Achaia from July 51 to July 52 AD. Since Rome was written during the following missionary journey, it couldn't have been any earlier than 52 AD. On the other end of the timeline, the Roman historian Publius Cornelius Tacitus tells us that there was widespread unrest in Rome over excessive taxation early in Emperor Nero's reign, which, from, which was from 56 AD to 58 AD. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 through 7 is a treatise on paying taxes and may indicate that Paul was aware of this unrest, which would make it no later than 58 AD. We know that Paul's letter was addressed to the churches in Rome. Let's talk a little bit about Rome, what was Rome was like during this time. Rome's population was probably close to a million people, which would have made it by far the largest city of Mediterranean antiquity. This massive population was sustained by a regular grain tax on the conquered lands and heavy grain imports that included 200,000 tons of grain each year. Nevertheless, most residents were poor, living in multi-story tenement apartments that grew cheaper 
but also smaller and less sturdy as the floors went higher. An estimated 40 to 50,000 of Rome's residents were Jewish. At least some of these were Jewish people and were Roman citizens, most of them descended from slaves freed more than a century earlier. In 69 BC, Pompey the Great, a celebrated Roman statesman and general, overran all of Judea, including Jerusalem. The last remaining holdouts of warring Jews retreated to the temple, which was heavily fortified with a deep valley around it. The Romans built a ramp and brought siege engines and battering rams from Tyre in what's today Lebanon. But every, night, every time they tried to position the battering rams, they were driven back by the defenders. Unfortunately for the Jews, the Romans knew of the Jewish religious laws, and they took great advantage of it. As hard as it is to believe, Jewish law didn't allow the soldiers to meddle with the enemy unless they were actively attacking on the Sabbath. So the Romans wisely deployed their battering rams on the Sabbath, and they were not molested at all while they were set in place. The next day, the gates were battered round, and the Romans made short work of the defenders. The historian Jophit Cephas says that 12,000 Jews were killed that day. After the battle, Pompey sent thousands of Jews back to Rome to be sold as slaves. But as it turns out, Jews made terrible slaves. They were not easy to control, and they obstinately adhered to their religious rights, including keeping the Sabbath. Eventually, the Romans chose to give them their freedom and assign them a place in the city across from the Tiber River. The majority of the Jews in Rome were poor, many working on the nearby docks. Historical sources from the period show that Romans ridiculed Jewish customs, especially circumcision, the Sabbath, and Jewish food laws. Because Rome mistrusted public meetings that it couldn't control, the Jewish community in Rome was not united. In contrast to Alexandria, where one leader spoke for the entire community, Rome had many synagogues with separate leaders. This environment apparently proved conducive for the spread of Jesus' message in a number of the synagogues. In the wake of a scandal involving a Jewish swindler, the emperor Tiberius expelled the Jewish community from Rome. Later, probably in 49 AD, the emperor Claudius did the same, although it's very likely that not all the Jews left. Claudius' expulsion is believed to have been related to Jewish divisions about the Messiah, so it seems likely that Jewish followers of Jesus were involved. That might explain why Aquila and Priscilla were among those compelled to leave. Many scholars believe that Gentile Christians went their separate way from the synagogues after this. Nevertheless, the Christian community in Rome grew exponentially. In 54 AD, the death of Emperor Claudius had the effect of repealing his previous expulsion order and the Jews returned to Rome. Visits by Paul, no doubt, encouraged the growth of the church there. In 64 AD, a fire destroyed much of Rome with its narrow alleys and many flimsy wooden structures. Rumors widely blamed the emperor Nero for the fire, but he found an easy and convenient scapegoat in the Christians. Though Nero systematically persecuted them, including burning them alive as torches to light his imperial gardens, the Christian church remained strong in Rome, after Nero's death. Let's turn to why Paul wrote the Christians in Rome. Some scholars have expressed the opinion that Romans was a theological treatise, a sort of soup to nuts, start to finish explanation of Paul's understanding of all doctrine. Romans is intensely theological, but it's still written to the address the specific situation of a specific church. Also, the letter does not present some important aspects of Paul's overall theology, such as his doctrine of the Lord's Supper or the Second Coming. Paul also gives quite a bit of attention to matters like the wrath of God and the Jews' rejection of Jesus, which are not discussed extensively in other letters. Several aspects of Romans, like the discussion of the weak and the strong, and the discussion about how believers should relate to the government, seem to reflect the struggles that this particular congregation faced. Thus, Romans was not a textbook of theology written to a bunch of strangers. Paul's had several reasons for writing Romans. First, Paul wanted to remind the Roman believers of some fundamental truths of the gospel, fulfilling his duty of proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul was aware that many of his messages might be misunderstood or misapplied. He wrote to clarify important aspects of his message to people that had only heard about him. Second, Paul wanted to address several problems the church was facing. 
In particular, he wanted to call the church to unity. He was aware that some differences in outlook between Gentile and Jewish believers had produced disunity within the congregation. These differences emerged in arguments about diet and the observance of Jewish holy days. Perhaps at the heart of the debate was the larger question, did the inclusion of the Gentiles and the people of God mean that God had abandoned his promises to Israel? Paul stresses the equality between Jewish and Gentile believers. Jews and Gentiles alike are condemned as sinners and are saved by grace through faith apart from the works of the law. The third reason Paul wrote to the Roman church was that Paul wanted to formally introduce himself to the Roman church and solicit their help for his Spanish missionary journey. Paul had long wanted to expand his travels to Spain where the gospel had not yet been taught. He wanted to receive help from the Roman church to fund that effort. Since Paul was writing to the people of Rome, you would have thought he would write in Latin. Instead, Romans is written in Greek. It's not actually as surprising as you would think. Greek was the primary language of Rome's Jewish residents. Also, Greek was understood in Rome and widely spoken. The Roman youth were taught Greek, and at the time it was fashionable to learn and study it. Finally, Paul understood that other churches would read his letter as well, and Greek was much more widely spoken than Latin. This concludes the introduction. I hope the background information will help you during our study of Romans. Now when you're ready, you can go back to the website and listen to the first lesson.